When I was at university, I was one of a group invited to the home of a fellow student called Ruth and her husband for a meal. She was slightly eccentric and great fun. Her husband was a writer for Coronation Street and they lived in a large rambling house near Lancaster. I knew most of the others, mature students who'd gone to university after pursuing a variety of careers. The evening was enjoyable and the conversation free-flowing. It quickly became clear that Ruth's husband enjoyed sharing his opinions on a range of subjects. My reference to having spent time with a Christian organisation helping drug addicts in Hong Kong also revealed him to be an ardent and eloquent atheist, keen to explain to us all why Christianity was nonsense. We sat as a group in their living room as he trotted through the objections I was very familiar with, in fact had raised myself, before God broke into my life as a 15-year-old and changed it entirely. What about all the other religions? Why pick this one God out of so many? If God loved us, why all the suffering? How could I possibly believe stories written centuries ago about events even older? Hadn't Christianity been the source of a great deal of suffering itself? I shared my testimony as best I could, how I'd become persuaded that Jesus had lived, been crucified and died, how the evidence, to my astonishment, pointed to him having been raised from the dead, why that mattered and why it demanded a response from me. I talked about miraculous healings of heroin addicts I'd seen time and time again, only the year before, how they'd come off heroin, often after decades of addiction, with no withdrawal symptoms if they prayed and allowed others to pray for them, how broken lives were made whole, families reunited, the poor fed, prisoners visited, the sick made well, and the hopeless given a reason to hope, through the activities of ordinary people whose lives had, I believed, been transformed themselves by an encounter with God. But God could end this debate easily, Gregor, he said. All he would need to do was appear unambiguously and show himself, this invisible God, reveal himself to us in this world, here and now. Show himself to everyone as indisputably God. Why was he hiding away from the world he supposedly created? Christians believe God not only created the universe, including you and me, but that he had an unquenchable love for his creation. Christians also believe something has gone terribly wrong. Creation as a whole, and we in particular, are marred by sin. We regularly and constantly mess up, behave cruelly, fail our family and friends. This isn't how it's supposed to be, and God is going to put it right. Incarnation is Latin for enfleshment. It refers to the extraordinary, audacious Christian claim that God took on human form in Jesus, that the eternal God stepped into human history at a particular point and a particular place. There are many mythological stories in which gods come to earth and interact with humans. They disguise themselves, pass themselves off as ordinary mortals, but they are never less than gods, as humans discover usually to their detriment. Alternatively, they appear as terrifying beings demanding worship. The incarnation is utterly different. It says God became just like you and me, but without sin. He experienced life with all its light and shade as we do. He knew what it was to enjoy a meal, to love, to be misunderstood, to suffer and to die. The Christian writer Alistair McGrath was asked what tipped him from atheism into faith. He explained that as an atheist, he would say something like this. Look, I'm here in space-time. I live in a particular bit of the universe at a particular time. And if there's a God, he's up in heaven, and so what? It makes no difference to me at all. God is utterly irrelevant to this life. And then people explained to him this idea of the incarnation, that Christ was not simply a good religious teacher, but that in him God entered into human history in human form. He suddenly realised, he said, that God journeyed with him. He didn't simply view his life from afar. It meant that God suffered and so knows what it's like, truly knows what it's like to be human. That, to Alistair, made all the difference. 
My faltering answer to Ruth's husband then was, of course, that the invisible God had indeed revealed himself, had become flesh and blood, had lived amongst his creation, had suffered and died, and had been raised from the dead, inaugurating a revolution that had changed my life and would, in due course, transform the whole of creation. He hadn't chosen a display of fear-inducing power, but submission and servanthood. That at least was what, what I tried to say. The conversation had moved on, and I don't know if anything I said made a jot of difference to the people at the party. But then I knew I'd been just like him, and God got through to me with all the love, grace and power that we saw in Jesus. Colossians 1, 15-17 says this, The Son is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As we look ahead to Christmas, may we remember that we worship a God who knows what it is to be human, who experienced in flesh and blood the human condition, and through whose death and resurrection we can be forgiven and made whole. This is the God we worship. Amen.